Hello and welcome. The coronavirus pandemic has created new challenges. One of them is going to be the pressure on migration and new waves of migration that might emerge thanks to people seeking better health care or even better opportunities both within countries as well as outside countries. Now, this is different from earlier waves of migration or is likely to be different. So how is this going to play out and what is the impact that this could have not just on the countries that are exporting talent or people, but also those who are importing them? And like we said, this could be new waves. To understand this better, I'm pleased to be rejoined by Parag Khanna, founder and managing partner of Future Map, a global strategy advisor. Parag, thank you very much for speaking with us. Pleasure. Great to be with you again, Govin. Right. So, uh, Parag, tell us, so you've uh, recently written an article in Politico on this, and you're really saying that this is going to trigger a new or newer waves of migration. Well, so let's step back for a moment. There is something so extraordinary about this point in time, which is that as we speak, migration, international migration, is basically zero. We have artificially suppressed all cross-border mobility other than repatriation, which you might say is like negative migration. It's people going home. So we've gone from December 2019, where we had a record, a historical record of 275 million migrants, people living outside their country of origin. And now we're reducing that number as people go home. As you well know, for example, there's a large effort to repatriate uh, many hundreds of thousands of Indian uh, construction workers and other guest workers in the Gulf countries, for example. So now we have to look forward. Now imagine it's six months from now, one year from now, and we have a vaccine. What happens then when migration is allowed again, country by country, pair of countries at a time, health bubbles, travel bubbles, people will have just spent up to one year potentially in lockdown in a red zone, in a country that has bad health care, where they've lost their jobs, where they're no longer earning money. And on all of the conditions, all of the pent up desire to leave, to move, will be exercised. And the question is, where will people go? Where will they be allowed to go? Where will they be let in? Where do they want to go? We've all been watching the news globally. We're seeing which countries have good healthcare systems, good medical systems, or providing uh, medical equipment and testing and so forth for their people, and which countries are not. And surely you will see people be pushing to leave the red zones and move to the green zones. And that is the question that we're asking. And this is an experiment, Govind. The world is going to, uh, is going to this experiment is going to play out on us as humanity, it's going to unfold over the next few years, and it's about to begin. And in, and what's the sense that you're getting? Because clearly, when it comes to health systems, let's say uh, a lot of people in Asia go to America, and America, I mean, obviously, is the land of opportunity, but has not been able to have a robust health system, at least to respond to the level of crisis that it's faced. Uh, maybe in Europe, things are looking a little better, but of course, Europe is not easy to migrate to. And though people traditionally have not to, to try too hard, because obviously, Europe uh, is more uh, is more insular in a manner of speaking, particularly when it comes to language and so on. Right. That's a great question. Well, so first of all, no one moves to America for free medical care, obviously, yeah. uh, unless your employer is giving <laughs> you a very generous package. You do move to Canada, however, for free medical care if you have legal residency. And that's why Americans have been moving to Canada since before the pandemic and probably will try to after the pandemic. That is also true for many people from developing countries, from poorer countries. Uh, they see Canada as a place where your citizenship journey begins the minute that you arrive. They're not threatening to revoke that the way is happening in the United States. Europe, of course, again, is providing not only it provides even a stipend uh, for um, uh, for asylum seekers and other migrants who arrive on its shores, even if they come illegally. Once they're registered, they're given certain benefits that are quite generous. Uh, and in fact, the country, migrants look very carefully and they see if Germany offers 100 euro more a month in Spain, they're going to walk to Germany if they have to, right? Now, of course, Europe has been quite restrictive, but what we have seen is that for talent, for people like Indians who are trained in computer science or mathematics or other very relevant disciplines, they are allocating a growing number of these so-called blue cards, right? The equivalent of the American uh, green card. And that's becoming more and more popular. It's only tens of thousands rather than hundreds of thousands. But that number is growing because Europe has such extreme labor shortages. So there are opportunities all over the world in different countries. Now, you mentioned healthcare. 
you may have heard that Thailand has just launched its own executive immigration program, which includes free annual medical screenings. And as we know, Thailand has been developing its medical tourism industry for years now, and so it has quite an advantage. And there's a, apparently a very substantial uptake for that program. And what are the countries from which people are applying to um, to be granted this executive immigration scheme in Thailand, it's actually America and Australia are the top two at the moment. So there will be a competition for those countries that want to, to treat migrants as investors. There's a competition to retain and attract them. Right. So countries like um, you know Thailand are popping up that are becoming popular. Canada is obviously getting positive attention. Those countries that have handled the crisis well, that have good medical systems, and that have liberal immigration policies are clearly the places where people want to go. Right, and, and you're saying that a country like Thailand is seeing competition from people in America and Australia to go there. This is the remarkable thing, of course, you know, uh, and then this is, as you know, something that I wrote about quite extensively in my, my Asia book. I said that, you know, migration has been for 150 years an east to west and south to north story. What's happening now is that you find people who are moving back, quote unquote, to places that have been thought of as developing because they have modernized their infrastructure, focused on the fundamentals and are luring back. Uh, talent or attracting new talent. Now you'll find many, the growing, the number of expatriates from Europe and, the, and North America who live in Asia is growing and growing and growing uh, because the quality of life here is very high. The cost of living is low. Unemployment is low. Public safety is high. Schools are good. All of these kinds of benefits of living in a city like a Singapore uh, or, uh, or, or other cities in the region, as far as New Zealand, Australia, even again, people who are moving to Bali, Indonesia, Phuket in Thailand, these expat hubs are popping up all over Asia. So migration is not just a one-way street anymore. There isn't one clear axis of desirability. There's more enclaves of stability that people are trying to get into and stay in. Right. Okay. Now, uh, you know, you talked about the 275 million people who in, in some sense are living out and now uh, some parts of that have begun uh, or have been returning to their homeland. So what is this going to mean? I mean, uh, to particularly to the homeland, whichever that is, and we can see it in India too, people coming back from the Middle East or other parts of the uh, parts of the world and more will come as these lockdowns lift. Uh, uh, India has just lifted its domestic uh, flight ban. The international will uh, most likely lift soon. And uh, the clamor that we hear is that most people actually are, don't care so much about the domestic flights, but really they are international flights because they either want to get out or get back in. Right. So those who are coming back, especially those from the Gulf, because they've lost their jobs, we know there's going to be a prolonged downturn and slowdown in any new construction activity in the Gulf countries. So for those Indians who are coming back, that's going to mean that they're adding really to the labor force, which where already there is a, a, you know, rising unemployment. So that's got to be a major concern for the Indian government providing these jobs. And therefore, internal migration becomes important because already now we have a huge internal migration in India. You had during the lockdown those who were going home to the villages. Now you have people who will not go back to the same city where there's still an economic slowdown, but we'll look for other cities or geographies of growth and potentially look to migrate to other countries where their work, where their services might be needed, such as in uh, Southeast Asia or in Central Asia, along infrastructure projects and corridors there. So it, the, the traditional vectors that we're used to, India to the Gulf and so forth, they might take us in new directions. But the immediate challenge, of course, for India is the large number now of already existing unemployed people within the country, and now those that have come back that will also be unemployed. Uh, uh, Parag, I had a slightly uh, different uh, uh, take on the, I mean, the question is a slightly different twist. Now, do you see uh, Gen Z, uh, you know, behaving differently or uh, displaying different migratory attitudes, if one may call it that? It's a big theme in the research that I'm doing right now. For one thing, of course, because they are they don't have children, either they're too young to have children or have no plans to have children, uh, that Gen Z is inherently more mobile, right? They don't have fixed assets, they don't have the intergenerational commitment of children and so forth, and therefore they're inherently mobile. They're also obviously digital natives. So in a, wor in a world where they can work remotely, 
they're happy to be anywhere and that anywhere could also be internationally while working for an Indian or a foreign global company. So yes, Gen Z is inherently more uh, footloose, if you will, than any previous generation in history and has an incentive uh, to move especially given the negative economic impact of the, the virus and the subsequent lockdown, because they know that no one is going to just hand them a job. They may have to go somewhere to get it. Right. Prag, you know, uh, in my earlier conversation with you, I asked about uh, supply chains. I asked you about China's uh, role and its preeminence and whether that was shifting. And uh, one of the things that you pointed out was that, you know, this is a process that had already begun. Mo the moving of, let's say, manufacturing capacity out of China, uh, uh, companies reorienting. How do you see that now and particularly uh, and more so in the light of this new migration uh, matrix, so to speak? It will continue to accelerate irrespective of what happens with migration. Why? Because actually Asian populations are already very large. So you already have 100 million people in Vietnam, close to that number in Thailand, that many in the Philippines, uh, double that number in Indonesia, and of course more than a billion people in India. So there's no shortage of labor force. So the shift to, of supply chains that is seeking a cost-efficient labor, cheaper than Chinese labor, is there all across South and Southeast Asia. The question has been how efficient is the labor force, how productive is the labor force, the quality of, 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 of production of, of, uh, of the sort of CapEx of the factories and facilities, and the connectivity to global markets and the trade agreements. All of those factors also play a role. Those are the areas where we're seeing improvement, right? Where we're seeing that ASEAN countries have joined both the TPP and the RCEP. India is trying to trade more, uh, you know, look east, uh, for example, and so on. So every country is competing for those supply chains that are coming out of China. And of course, China is not doing itself any favors with its policies. And therefore, this is an important part of India's strategy at the moment, one that obviously that makes a lot of sense uh, to focus on capturing those value chains and making sure that those things that are sold in India are made in India. Right. Uh, Parag uh, Kanna, thank you so much for speaking with us and always a pleasure to speak with you. Likewise. Thank you.